Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, it is really exciting to be with you, and we at the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities are thrilled to be able to partner with the Valentine Richmond History Center, uh, TMI, and others for this uh, Future Richmond's Past for this community conversation series. Uh, tonight is a beginning of a conversation that we look forward to having over the next five months as we explore five decades in Richmond's history. Uh, the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities was known uh, at its founding in 1935 in Virginia as the NCCJ, the National Conference of Christians and Jews. And the organization in, 1930, in 1963 started an event called the Brotherhood Citation Dinner, which has evolved over the years to now be known as the Humanitarian Awards Dinner. And so as we were thinking about this year being the 50th anniversary of the Humanitarian Awards Dinner, uh, we wanted to look back and learn about Richmond's history from the perspective of humanitarians. And we're thrilled tonight to have one of our past award winners here with us. I'll tell you as an aside, um, and it's a, a sad statement about uh, our region losing some of its history, we had a challenging time connecting with uh, honorees from the 1960s. Uh, because if you think about someone who was getting an award in the 1960s, that person was likely in his or her 40s or 50s at the time. And so we were reaching out to several of the children, and in some cases, grandchildren of those award winners, uh, one of whom is in Florida right now um, and said he wasn't able to come. Uh, one said he doesn't like driving at night, uh, and so he didn't want to be here. Uh, one said he didn't really remember much about the 60s, and so he uh, didn't want to be here. Uh, but we're thrilled uh, that Dr. Alex B. James uh, said yes to us. Uh, Dr. James uh, lived in several places before coming to Richmond. Uh, the last place before Richmond was Marshall, Texas, and he arrived in 1942. Uh, he was greeted uh, by a pretty stark contrast of segregation and racism throughout the region, but also a welcoming environment at Virginia Union University. And while his plan was to be at Virginia Union and to be in Richmond for two years, uh, from 1942 to 1944. It is now 2012, and he is still in Richmond, uh, and we are all the beneficiaries of that history. Uh, Dr. James, after graduating from Virginia Union University and his, with his undergraduate degree, stayed and received a Master of Divinity degree. Uh, he then served in many uh, faculty and administrative roles, serving as an instructor of biblical studies, as dean of students, as dean of the School of Theology, as vice president, president, Professor of Pastoral Theology, Chancellor and Dean, and President Emeritus. Uh, in addition to his work on campus, Dr. James was a significant icon in the broader Richmond region. He was the first African American to be elected as President of the Virginia State Board of Education. He was the first African American to be elected President of the Association of Theological Schools in the United States and Canada. Uh, he was the first African American person to be named to a major corporate board in Virginia. He was the first to serve as president of the National Conference of Christians and Jews. Among his many awards, in 1975, Dr. James received the Humanitarian Award from what was then the National Conference of Christians and Jews, and he's also the only person to have received a second award from our organization in 2009, the Jeffrey B. Spence Award for Interfaith Understanding. Uh, he has written a book and a supplement to the book, Three Score and Ten Plus, The Pilgrimage of an African American Educator, which explores his life from 1922 to 1997. And then a supplement, A Legacy of Leadership That Continues Today, which was published in the last year uh, by Dr. James. Um, and the last thing I'll say before we get to hear from him is that on December 17th, Dr. James celebrated his 90th birthday. <laughs> over 100 people on the campus of Virginia Union for a wonderful birthday celebration. Family members, friends, elected officials, all to celebrate uh, the legacy and the life of Dr. Alex Bledsoe James. So we are indeed uh, able to sit at the feet of a giant in Richmond's history and learn tonight. Um, and I'll ask you, Dr. James, to talk first about your initial impressions of Richmond. Uh, you arrived in 1942. What do you remember from that time period? In 1942, I came from San Antonio, Texas to continue my education at Virginia Union University. I came as a junior student because I finished a junior college 
in San Antonio. So I plan to do my junior and senior year here and then move on to graduate school elsewhere. But those two years turned into 70 years. <laughs> and I've been here ever since. But in order that you might understand how Richmond greeted a stranger from San Antonio, Texas. At that time, airline travel wasn't popular. See, every day, you all talk about traveling, plane, but back then it was either bus, train, or car. <clears throat> That's a long time ago, wasn't it? <laughs> well, when I got to Washington, D.C., the conductor tapped me on the shoulder and said, follow me. I know what he meant. He's in charge of transportation. So I followed him. <clears throat> he took me to a segregated car right behind the cold fire engine with the soot and the coal dust and everything else turned my white shirt into a gray shirt. <laughs> when I got to Broad Street Station, there was a dispatcher in the middle of the station giving directions. <clears throat> this way, that way. Whites, you got this door. Blacks, you got the side door. Or about the side door. I got in the line to get a cab to get to Virginia Union. I noticed that uh, people who got in line after me received attention more than I was receiving it. <coughs> so I asked the dispatcher, I said, well, what about me? These people came after me. He said, be patient. Your cab is coming, and that cab was Manhattan Cab, a cab company owned by blacks. At that time, whites and blacks <coughs> didn't necessarily ride the same cabs in Richmond. Our government, Manhattan Cab, and because it was late in the afternoon, it was really evening, then about 10 o'clock at night, really. Ask the cab driver, say, is there any place I can get anything to eat before I can hit the campus? He said, well, sure, there's a white tower on the corner of Broad and Lombardi, just a few blocks from the campus. So that's en route. Let's stop there. He said, it's just a hamburger place. I said, well, if you're hungry, even a hamburger is good at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> So I went in the front door of the hamburger joint, White Tower, at Lombardi and Broad, and the cashier told me, take out to the side window. Mm -hmm. I said, thank you, no thank you. I got back in the camp, went to the camp, hungry that night. The next morning I got up with a group of new students at the university. We wanted to explore downtown Richmond. So we walked from the campus up to Broad Street. At that time, you didn't have bus streetcars. street cars. Any of you remember street cars? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the system, street cars. So we got on a streetcar, took our seats. And we noticed that the streetcar didn't move. And so we asked the conductor, say, what, what, when are we going to uh, on our way downtown? He said, when you fill it from the back, we'll move. Well, here we were. Strangers, youngsters from different parts of the country, not even registered. 
as a student of the Kennedy Union, knowing no one in Richmond. Now the decision was to be a troublemaker that, not, that, that uh, morning or to get off and walk. Wizard told us to get off and walk because if they put us in jail, the time dispatch headline the next morning would be troublemakers come to Richmond to start trouble. So we walked down Broad Street and uh, we noticed we passed two or three little restaurants with little signs in the window, small signs, white only. So we, um, a fellow from New York was in that group. He said, well, there's a Woolworth downtown. I know that uh, we can get some meat there because I'm from New York and Woolworth's open in New York. We went to Woolworth and uh, stood at the counter. The cashier said, take out service to the end. So, those are my first 24 hours in Richmond. Mm -hmm. What an experience for a stranger, 2,000 miles from home, being treated almost like an outcast. We saw a young man who was well groomed. We asked him about an eating place where we could get lunch. He recommended Slaughter's Hotel and Cord Walter Shop on Lee Street. So we had lunch there. So those were the first hours in Richmond. But those first hours in Richmond put a determination in me. If ever I could do anything to bring about changes in the capital city of the Confederacy, I was going to do it. So every opportunity came around <coughs> for me to work in organizations, I began working in those organizations. So let's talk with Dr. James a little bit about that work. So 1942, you arrived. After those 24 hours, you stayed in Richmond, much to our benefit all these years later. And uh, 18 years later, you were a dean uh, at Virginia Union University and about to become vice president. And in 1960, we heard about, um, in the CERT quiz, one of the significant events uh, was Virginia Union students marching to downtown Richmond, uh, lunch counters, and then holding a sit-in at Tallheimer's. Uh, what do you remember from that, and particularly what was your role as an administrator of Virginia Union? Well, as dean of students, naturally I was in charge of all student affairs. And so the dean of the college and I got together and said, we're going to support our students in this movement. And as long as they are peaceful and nonviolent, we are with them 100%. And we supported them all the way during those during that city movement. My wife and I put up our home as collateral just in case a union student would be arrested so we wouldn't have to stay in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, Billy Tallheimer, he was uh, head, head of the Tallheimer uh, department store. He was a moving factor in bringing that program to a conclusion. He wasn't for it, but he had to join the other companies or else he'd been ostracized. There were a committee of four. He would have us each day to break the picket line, to come up to his office and say we could strategize to bring this terrible movement to a conclusion. And through book Billy Tallhouse's efforts and the effort of the committee, 
and some other uh, things that happened, even on the national front, the whole thing broke. There was a time when blacks couldn't try on clothes in Millen Road. If you want, if you want to buy a hat, they would put a stocking cap on your head to make sure that no grease or anything else would get on the hat. Those were some days, my friend. But those are the days that we endured them, and thank God Almighty, they have changed. Now you tell some of you youngsters, and probably some of you here tonight, just can envision the old Richmond acting in such a terrible manner. But I'm here the living witness. It was Richmond. And thank God we now have a new Richmond. Now when that conductor tapped me on the shoulder on that plane, he never envisioned that one day that same man on whose shoulder you tap would be head of the State Board of Education. He didn't know that that man would become president of all the theological schools in the United States and Canada. He didn't know that that man would be chairman of the Richter Planning Commission. Friends, is not the color of one's skin. It's the contents of one's mind and character. And that's what we have to emphasize forever and forever and forever. <clears throat> For all of us are made in the image of Almighty God and we're God's children living together in a peaceful society. So when, when Richard Memorial Hospital was built, that fantastic community is getting together. They had one floor for blacks in Richard Memorial Hospital. i never forget there was one man on the board <coughs> And uh, he protested the idea of one floor deadly for blacks. And this man told this deep seated southerner there's going to come a time when a black and a white would be sharing the same room. Mm -hmm. Several years later, that happened, and that black called that southern white man and say, Mister, I told you it's going to happen. It has happened. I'm now visiting a friend in Richmond Hospital and his roommate is a white person. Time to change. We, we, we have learned lessons from the past. And when, when we think about it, how ridiculous was all that foolish happening. But it happened, and we live <coughs> by it. And even today, some people still have not lived some of those crazy notions. But uh, hopefully, before I get to be 100, <laughs> all of it might be erased. It's on the way. We're not there yet. So let's We've talk come about a long way, but a long way to go. So in the 1960s, there were significant events that helped to move civil rights forward uh, here in Richmond and certainly around the country. We can think about the I Have a Dream speech. We can think about uh, assassinations of key political and social leaders. What do you remember being the reaction to those? Were there, uh, in Richmond, were there reactions the way we saw in some other communities where there were riots and other things? What was happening? Well, Richmond wasn't as bad as some other towns, thank goodness. We didn't have the same riots in Richmond that we had in some other cities. 
and I have to contribute that to the leadership that we had in Richmond. Very dynamic leaders in Richmond. And those leaders had followers who would at least listen to them. I remember um, Dr. Henderson, who was president of Verge at the time, and I, I was vice president, we organized a $18 million campaign. And uh, we're out to get a leadership gift from someone in Richmond to head the campaign. And this man said, if you will promise us that your students will never demonstrate, will never march, will never participate in any civil rights movement, I'll give you $1 million to hit the campaign. Dr. Ennis looked at me, I looked at him, and as bad as we needed, <laughs> that $1 million would have said, thank you, no thank you. It was good enough. It was the next day with Emmett Till. You remember Emmett Till? You heard of him? Mm -hmm. He was murdered in Mississippi. Yes. There was the president of, of the student body at the University of Richmond called the president of our student body and said, this is awful. Let us have a protest from your campus to the state capitol to protest Emmett Till's murder. Now Dr. Hanson don't look like fools. Stand in the middle of the camp and y'all go back. Don't y'all prove that? We got a million dollars coming. But we did it. <laughs> and we never regretted that movement. There's another strange thing that happened. Dr. A.G. Richardson, who was an official with the State Board of Education during the 60s. In fact, at that time, I think he was the only executive who had an earned terminal degree. But they wouldn't give him an office down in the State Board of Education building. They rented an office for him in a black business building in Jackson Ward, the Southern Aid building on Clay Street. Those are the kind of things we had to endure. Time to change, thank God. We heard also a little bit earlier um, that Richmond in the 1960s had its first female mayor. Uh, do you remember how that came about and, and what the reaction was? Uh, to that, uh, El Eleanor P. Shepard in 1962. Well, Eleanor Shepard was a delightful lady, and she really had the support of the black community. And uh, we were very pleased that Richmond had matured enough to have a female mayor. And of course, we got the first black mayor, you know, that was real victorious. And then, Virginia Union takes pride in the fact that not only gave Richmond first black male, but gave Virginia the first black governor in the United States. Virginia Union graduate. Those are the kind of students we have produced in the year. And we're proud of the fact that Union has made that kind of contribution. And we, we never to take a back seat and lower our standards, our thinking, to buy other people's ideas. So we're talking a little bit about some of the social movements, civil rights, those things. I wonder also if we can talk just about life in Richmond. So in, in the late 1950s, 1956, a Willow Lawn Shopping Center was built. In 1958, the Richmond Petersburg Turnpike opened. Uh, we saw a little bit later on, uh, between 1963 and 1965, uh, a huge downtown boom with the construction of more than 700 buildings in the city. What was life like before 
that downtown boom? What was life like in Richmond afterward? Well, Richmond was kind of departmentalized for a while. People in South Richmond traded on Hall Street. People in South Savage traded around the stores um, that were more or less community oriented. Mm. But uh, they got to the place where they started shopping downtown like everybody else. But the strange thing about that, there was a right side of Broad Street and a wrong side of Broad Street. Have you heard of that? <coughs> Some folks have. No, tell Some folks have not. So. Anytime a store would would operate on the side of the street opposite Middle Road and Tall Island, that was the wrong side. Yes. The right side is where the big department stores were. Right. And therefore, the, the smaller stores had to um, do the best they could. And, and they really figured that at the wrong side of the road. What, what was the impact, if you remember, on the building of Interstate 64 and Interstate 95? We know that there were neighborhoods that were displaced, uh, homes uh, that, that were demolished. Do you remember how those decisions were made about where those roads were placed and, and what the impact was on particular communities? Well, it broke up a lot of communities. In fact, it ran, it ran through up some areas in uh, West End, some Lovely homes were destroyed, and uh, you take uh, downtown to some historic um, places were destroyed because of interstate. But they thought it was for the good of the community, so it went through. And city council had the power to make those kind of decisions, and they were made. And, uh, but now uh, we found out that the shopping malls have just taken over from downtown. In fact, there's hardly any downtown. Now for shopping, for business, for financial district, yes. But you find very little shopping downtown now because people go to the shopping mall and where plenty of parking and other advantages that will serve their needs. So times have just changed. What do you remember in the 1960s, Dr. James, about uh, regional relations? Uh, so there, I've read a little bit about uh, consideration of consolidation in the early 1960s uh, and then their annexation. Uh, what were the relations between the city of Richmond and Ryko, Chesterfield, Hanover? Have you seen any movement from the 1960s? To the <clears throat> not, not very little, and I think after the annexation of Chesterfield, uh, taking uh, moving into part of Richmond, I think that was the last big annexation. And I think everything since that time has been annexation against it because they want to uh, be separate. Do you remember some of those decisions as being controversial? Were people upset about them? Was it? But upset, but they didn't have the power to do anything about it because the people in power made the decision. And as long as, long as you have the uh, power structure making the decision, you're helpless. Mm. Now what you can do. That's why it's good to uh, get into the power-based organizations where, where, where your vote will count and uh, your voice will be heard and people will listen to you. Let's think, I want to think a little bit, we've talked about some Richmond events. I want to think about what was happening nationally in the 1960s. Um, so we had uh, Kennedy beating Nixon in the presidential election in 1960, taking over in 61. Uh, and then he was assassinated uh, in 1963. Lyndon Johnson defeating Barry Goldwater in 1964 in the election. 
Uh, and then civil rights legislation coming out of that, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What was that time period like politically? Uh, we, we hear a lot, especially this week, about politics in the U.S. Um, and dysfunction. What do you remember from that time period nationally, well, the residue in Richmond? Well, well, I think that period opened the eyes of a lot of people that it's time to change. And because there was time for change, you had people running for office nationally that they weren't running before. You said you had very few black people in Congress. So, in fact, I remember a time we only had one or two black congressmen. But now well, we, we have more than that. And, and I think uh, that period brought about those changes. Lyndon Johnson did a whole lot to create a good spirit in America. Did a whole lot. Do you remember 1964 and 65 Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act as being definitive moments? Was life different before them for you than after them? Or as you saw education in, in Richmond, as you saw voting in Richmond, as you saw um, where people lived in Richmond, did things change as a result of those laws from your perspective? Well, there are some people who felt that um, blacks and white can't study together and get a good education. <clears throat> well, that's the most ridiculous thing you ever heard. Uh, nobody had any, any monopoly on brain power. Uh, and uh, a lot of the people in the city started sitting there students to county school because they thought to get a better education in the county school rather than a predominant black school system. That's not necessarily true. If the child has the ability, that child can learn. But it, it, it's again, it's just a hangover from the days when segregation was the order of the day. It, it comes out in, in subtle ways now. Before, it was blatant. But today, it's subtle. But it's still there in a lot of places. What do you remember about key social movements, protests at the time? Uh, Vietnam War was taking place, we had the Cold War, uh, feminism, uh, significant uh, gay rights movement. What do you remember in, in Richmond? Uh, we saw an image of Monroe Park, uh, folks gathering there. Uh, were those social movements common? How was the Vietnam War in particular uh, responded to in Richmond? I don't remember in detail uh, uh, about it. Some people filled up. Uh, it should be supporting us for the sake. But the, uh, I never got into the intricacies of uh, the significance of all of that. And uh, therefore, I really can speak authoritatively uh, on that subject. I want to ask you a little bit about um, what you remember about NCCJ at the time, uh, the predecessor to the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities and particularly the significance of the Humanitarian Awards Dinner at the time of Brotherhood Citation Dinner. Uh, so I'll ask you a little bit about that and then uh, we'll invite some questions uh, from folks here to so be thinking about uh, those as we hear a little bit. 1963, the Brotherhood Citation Awards Dinner uh, was started. That was the first one, December 11th of that year. Uh, do you remember that? Uh, I don't yes, I you? do. Okay, and what was involved, what, what made that significant? I think there were maybe close to 800 people there. Yeah. Well, at that time, there was the biggest dinner of that nature in the whole whole state, and uh, it was a big deal. But I hate to admit this, but it's the truth. Even NCCJ had problems. I remember the committee of four of us going to the administration of NCCJ and saying. It's about time now that you can find at least one black qualified 
to get an award. <laughs> the answer was, it may hurt our receipts. Oh Are you more interested in what the organization stands for? Are you more interested in the dollar? Mm -hmm. See, you know, sometimes we have to put the dollar behind us. Just like Dr. Henson, I put that million dollars behind us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to stand on principle. Mm -hmm. And it took us several years to get NCCJ. And I'm an opponent of it. I've been working with them all these years to be convinced that you don't honor people just because of, of what they bring in financially, but because of what they have meant to the community. So now NCCJ has come alive. <coughs> we honor people who are worthy to be honored, and the dollar is not, not a significant factor. <coughs> Yeah, so let's let's hear some questions from you. Um,